have to welcome the two. Okay. Thanks for recording. And uh, this is a monthly seminar series uh, where we aim to provide a platform where we discuss the current topics in tropical ecology. And we usually give the space to a younger uh, researchers, which are introduced by an uh, established researcher. And after that, after the two or three sm smaller talks, we discuss and give the opportunity to everyone to get involved actively. And the society, besides organizing these seminars, is also organizing uh, international conference a yearly. Next year, we should meet in Montpellier. We are having the journal Ecotropica, which is peer reviewed and publishing for no cost. And the society is further awarding some grants, awards, and it has also a very active student group, which you can join on our web pages. Um, uh, as we have the two speakers today, we are going to discuss the pollination in tropical systems. And the first speaker is Robert Tropek, who is the head of the laboratory, which splits across the two institutions. He is based partly at the Charles University in Prague and partly uh, in the laboratory of community ecology in the biology center in Czech, uh, in České Budějovice. And the second talk will be given by Sally Sakhawakar. I hope I, I pronounced that correctly. And uh, she is the PhD student working on the pollination systems along the latitudinal and altitudinal gradients in Robert Laboratory. And both of them work actually in Cameroon, in tropical Africa. And I believe that this is where they will be taking us today. So thank you for your attention and uh, welcome everyone. And now we would like to start with Robert's talk. Thank you. Hello everybody. I hope you can uh, see my shared screen and hear me. Uh, thank you very much for uh, invitation. Uh, like uh, I will be talking uh, uh, about our research on pollination ecology in uh, Cameroon, specifically on Mount Cameroon. And uh, I have actually two apologies uh, in the beginning. Like first, even after almost two years uh, living with COVID, uh, like uh, speaking online is making me uh, quite uh, nervous. So uh, maybe apologize this if it happened. And the second is that actually uh, I was asked uh, to have the talk for more or less 30 minutes, which is for me a bit uh, unusual format I'm uh, I'm used to talk for something like 45 to 60 minutes or to have like short talks for conference and this is something in between so I strongly hope that uh, the amount of details uh, will fit uh, into this limit and it will not be too short or too long all right so let's start uh, it will be about uh, like uh, patterns and drivers and of uh, plant pollinator uh, interactions on Mount Cameron uh, in the beginning I have to specify that of course I'll be talking about uh, uh, quite uh, complex uh, and abundant uh, data and uh, these were collected uh, uh, by many people and uh, I need to acknowledge especially uh, Dr. Stefan Janeček who is actually co-leading uh, with me uh, most of our uh, joint uh, uh, pollination projects uh, including this on Mount uh, Cameroon. Stefan is currently in Cameroon, they just left uh, field work and uh, they are enjoying uh, some rest uh, in uh, Cameroonian uh, pub in the foothill of Mount Cameroon. So uh, actually the general introduction, I will make uh, as short as possible because I somehow suppose that uh, whoever is watching uh, such video uh, is familiar, uh, familiar in the topic and at least know what pollination is. And of course, uh, this is uh, basically uh, this is basically a uh, reproduction of plants, uh, which is uh, like uh, uh, serviced uh, uh, by some uh, by some uh, vectors, by some uh, animal vectors in our case, uh, mostly insects, but also some uh, vertebrates. And actually, it's a pretty uh, important uh, interaction in the nature. Uh, like uh, more or less 90% uh, of flowering plants uh, in the world are pollinated by animals, and only very minor uh, plant species are. Uh, still uh, uh, pollinated by uh, wind or some other uh, biotic uh, factors like water and uh, all the rest actually evol ev evolved or co-evolved uh, with their uh, pollinators for this uh, uh, interaction. Actually, uh, pollination uh, seems to be a pretty important uh, interaction or driver uh, of uh, like uh, flowering uh, plants uh, 
evolution. Uh, it is most probably one of the uh, like uh, most important uh, drivers uh, for their uh, diversification uh, in the past, and uh, uh, yeah, obviously, especially in tropics uh, where like uh, relying on some abiotic factors like wind. Uh, can be not so efficient because of high temperature, because of uh, lack of uh, lack of winds, uh, because of uh, high humidity uh, in the understory of tropical uh, forest, uh, uh, led uh, to the fact that uh, most uh, of the plants are really uh, animal pollinated. And of course, this diversification uh, or this coevolution led to a really uh, high diversification of flowers uh, of various types and so on. Uh, but also for uh, but also uh, for diversification of many groups of pollinators. And of course, I'm pretty sure that you are aware that uh, most of pollinators uh, are insects, uh, but uh, in the tropics, uh, it's getting to be uh, more funny uh, and more interesting because also uh, quite a few groups of vertebrates uh, evolved to be efficient pollinators. Um, I should mention, especially birds, uh, like um, all of you have heard about uh, hummingbirds, but there are a few other uh, groups of uh, pollinating, like specialized pollinating uh, birds. And I will be mentioning some sunbirds uh, from Africa, uh, but also there are some uh, groups of bats, uh, either fruit uh, bats or just regular bats, uh, which are really highly specialized for pollination. And also some rodents and other non-flying uh, mammals can uh, pollinate uh, flowers. Uh, basically, uh, as I said, uh, I will not be explaining what pollination per se uh, means. Uh, it's basically uh, carrying uh, pollen uh, from flower to flower and uh, thus uh, servicing uh, reproduction of plant. And of course, uh, the pollinators uh, are usually taking uh, some reward. Uh, so it seems to be quite a, a nice um, case of mutualism, but in, in the reality, it's uh, quite uh, different. It's basically still uh, some kind of a uh, so some kind of a, uh, like a competition uh, for the resources. And of course, the plant uh, would like to be pollinated by a single visitor uh, who would be bringing pollen from other flower and uh, taking all its uh, uh, pollen to uh, another one and ideally to save uh, as much uh, resources as possible. So basically, uh, plants uh, don't uh, always uh, uh, reward the pollinators uh, as they would deserve. Uh, on the other hand, the pollinators are really not motivated uh, in most of the cases, uh, except uh, the very few very specialized ones, but they are really not motivated uh, by like uh, bringing this service uh, to flowers, but they are really uh, motivated by the reward, uh, most uh, commonly by pollen or by nectar. And uh, the pollination in most of the cases is not active, it's quite passive and uh, it's um, only done uh, by some chance. So basically uh, this uh, friendly relationship is not working uh, so much and uh, like uh, this is good to have in your in your mind uh, if you're uh, talking or thinking about uh, pollination. Uh, what is actually uh, the most interesting for me uh, like uh, in pollination uh, interactions in pollination ecology uh, is the trade-off between like being highly specialized and being highly generalized. And of course, these two strategies are just the two extremes uh, of uh, like a, a continuous uh, gradient uh, uh, from highly specialized flowers or pollinators. In this case, uh, uh, I will mention this uh, uh, Lorantace uh, flower uh, of Tapinantus uh, rubromarginatus, which are uh, really uh, highly specialized to uh, bird pollination. And uh, normally uh, before the visit, uh, the flowers are even closed, uh, as you see here. And uh, like uh, pollinating specialized birds uh, need to really manually open the flowers uh, by their beak, uh, which actually, uh, which is actually almost impossible for all other pollinators. So basically uh, nobody can uh, steal uh, the rewards uh, unless uh, it is opened by the uh, highly specialized pollinator. And the other like extreme uh, is uh, this uh, mm, like a morphologically generalized flower of Hypericum revolutum, uh, which is actually producing a lot of nectar. It's uh, easily accessible uh, by many insects, but also by uh, birds because it grows in Cameroonian highlands. And uh, this is the uh, opposite. But uh, of course, most of the plants are somewhere uh, in between uh, these two extremes uh, uh, along the gradients. And uh, 
These are bringing, of course, a lot of trade-offs. Uh, in, uh, in some cases, it is much better uh, to be highly specialized and to save uh, resources uh, for rewards uh, to your only pollinator. But of course, you are also very sensitive. And if your pollinator or your partner uh, has uh, some problem, uh, you will have problem as well. Uh, on the other hand, in some other cases, especially uh, if you have uh, a lot of resources, and for instance, to produce nectar uh, for plant, it mainly requires uh, sunlight and uh, uh, water. So basically, it is not uh, so costly. Uh, uh, so uh, sometimes it's really, uh, it can be uh, really uh, efficient to rely uh, or to offer uh, your uh, rewards, especially nectar, to almost uh, everybody, to almost every, uh, uh, to almost uh, every pollinator or visitor, and just to rely that one of them sooner or later uh, will uh, bring uh, the right pollen or will, will carry your pollen to the uh, right uh, flower. Uh, this uh, uh, specialization in uh, pollination interactions is actually quite uh, important, uh, uh, quite important, uh, like part of biodiversity. Like uh, uh, if you are speaking about biodiversity, we usually mean just the species richness uh, of uh, different groups. But uh, uh, in, in, in reality, uh, like uh, the biodiversity is created also by these interspecific interactions, yeah, uh, because there are like a uh, complicated networks of these interactions in the communities, and uh, basically this is uh, what creates uh, the uh, ecosystems. It's not just uh, the few like uh, independent uh, uh, like uh, groups of species or something like that, but uh, I find most interesting and uh, most important for the ecosystems mainly how they uh, interact. Uh, basically, uh, that specialization of interactions is very important uh, for uh, like a coexistence of species, but also for their uh, for their diversification, because this is one of the uh, main uh, driver uh, for diversification. Uh, and of course, uh, like uh, this is uh, uh, then uh, one of the responsible factors also uh, for the current uh, patterns of uh, biodiversity. But on the other hand, uh, these uh, patterns of specialization or even like uh, the interaction networks uh, themselves, uh, they are quite unknown, especially in tropics. Uh, like, uh, 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 as I already said, uh, the specialization of interactions uh, is uh, very closely related uh, to biodiversity, uh, which was already uh, uh, which was already mentioned uh, uh, by Alfred Wallis, and then uh, it was uh, like uh, as usually uh, noticed uh, by uh, Rob MacArthur, who actually uh, Involved this, uh, involved this uh, into his uh, very influential uh, theories uh, about uh, niche and niche breadth, and uh, like uh, it's obvious uh, that uh, there is some uh, there is some uh, interaction, there is some relationship uh, between the species richness or diversity uh, of species and uh, their uh, specialization. Because if you have a high diversity, uh, there is a usually a big competition, also high diversity of resources, and it could be uh, more uh, efficient to get uh, as specialized as possible for some uh, selected uh, uh, resource. And of course, if you are uh, getting to be higher, uh, to be more and more specialized, it can be then easier uh, to basically uh, split populations into two species and to basically uh, drive uh, uh, drive uh, like speciation and diversity again. So there could be some uh, uh, positive uh, force feedback uh, between uh, diversity uh, and uh, uh, specialization level. Uh, MacArthur actually uh, defined his latitude uh, niche breadth hypothesis based on this presumption, but actually it could be uh, applied also for some other gradients of uh, diversity or species rich uh like independent on latitude and this is actually how we are getting uh, to the topic because uh, studying uh latitudinal patterns of anything especially of like interactions among uh, different uh, groups of uh, organisms uh can be very uh, very difficult so we are using uh, like elevation gradients in different mountains uh, to somehow substitute uh, these uh, uh, latitudinal uh, patterns, because of course, uh, in most of the mountains, uh, uh, you have uh, like a 
higher species richness, either in lowlands or in some mid elevations. And then it is actually decreasing uh, with the uh, uh, rising uh, uh, elevation uh, to the uh, to the summit. So we have some gradients of diversity, uh, some of them linear, some of them unlinear and so on. And we can actually study, uh, for instance, how species diversity is related uh, to like a species <coughs> specification. Uh, like uh, it is highly understudied, uh, like uh, there are few synthesis or meta-analysis uh, showing some patterns. Uh, for instance, uh, this one uh, is quite influential, but it's showing uh, completely, uh, uh, like, oh, sorry, it's showing uh, the pattern which I was talking about. This is actually uh, some measure of uh, generalization. So uh, lower, uh, lower values are actually uh, more specialized species and uh, uh, it seems that the plant pollinator interactions uh, can be uh, specialized under some conditions uh, in some mid elevations or in lowlands there usually uh, you have a high uh, diversity as well. On the other hand, uh, like uh, these analyses are um, always so far uh, based on the like a uh, synthesis of many studies using different kinds of uh, uh, methodology, like a different definition of network, different definition of uh, uh, interactions uh, and specialization and so on. And uh, we are not sure if uh, these uh, uh, if these patterns are uh, based on the reality of or not. Uh, basically, uh, it's uh, mainly or like uh, the main doubts uh, besides the different uh, character of the data sets are coming also from the uh, from the fact that the uh, different gradients uh, uh, are uh, can be really different, not only in diversity, but also in environmental conditions and uh, in the same elevations, uh, even in the Alps, uh, in the like really neighboring mountains, uh, you can have like a uh, uh, different zones, different diversity and so on. And if we are going to the details, even a single mountain uh, can have completely different uh, conditions on uh, different uh, uh, sites uh, or different orientation of its slopes. So what I uh, think uh, to be really important uh, to like study this uh, relationship uh, is to sample somehow comparable data uh, under uh, like a reasonable standardization and under uh, similar uh, conditions. And this is exactly what we are trying to do on Mount Cameroon. Uh, Mount Cameroon is uh, uh, like in the border between uh, Western and Central Africa. It lays completely uh, in the uh, belt of the uh, uh, tropical uh, rainforests of uh, Africa. Uh, it's actually at the border uh, between West African forest or West African rainforest and uh, the Congo Basin uh, rainforest. Uh, so it has really uh, highly uh, diversity. Uh, it's a big uh, biodiversity hotspot. Uh, like uh, it is mountain uh, belt is also quite highly isolated from the other high mountain ranges uh, in Africa. So uh, it's uh, supposed to be quite unique. But if we check uh, the uh, available uh, data sets uh, in uh, basically any reviews or synthesis or meta-analysis or uh, on uh, um, plant pollinator interactions or even any other interspecific interactions, uh, you will realize that from tropical uh, Africa, there is not so many data. Actually, in this uh, review uh, on the tropical, uh, uh, on the pollination networks in the tropics, uh, there is uh, just one dot in the Mount Cameroon area this, these are actually uh, uh, our data. Otherwise, uh, there is almost nothing uh, from uh, the rainforests of uh, Africa. Uh, something more about uh, Mount Cameroon. It's a pretty young volcano. Uh, it uh, actually started to rise uh, just uh, 3 million uh, years ago. Uh, it's quite isolated, uh, even uh, within this uh, uh, mountain range, which are mostly tectonic. Uh, volcanic uh, at the breakdown uh, of the African tectonic uh, plate uh, at the border of uh, Cameroon and uh, Nigeria. Uh, but uh, it is actually like uh, in, the, in the high parts, it is uh, still active. You can uh, find some recent uh, craters there. Uh, but uh, these are uh, just, uh, let's say, relatively small uh, volcanic activities, uh, usually resulting in like no big explosions or something like that, but uh, quiet, uh, mild uh, flows of uh, lava, uh, which uh, you can see here from the past uh, century. Like the eruptions are more or less uh, every 20 years. So uh, basically, uh, we can be expecting the next eruption uh, very soon. 
On the other hand, uh, its uh, uh, habitats are pretty pristine. It's uh, really uh, one of a few African mountains with the, uh, like a reasonable range of uh, human undisturbed uh, forests or almost undisturbed forests. And actually what is unique on Mount Cameroon is that uh, it really rises uh, uh, from the seashore. Like uh, most of the African mountains are uh, already part of some uh, like um, plateaus or uh, something uh, similar. So they're usually, uh, their food hills are usually already at uh, uh, 1000 meters or something like that. But the Mount Cameroon is really rising uh, from the sea and because uh, uh, like uh, uh, because it's a, a young volcano and there is uh, not so much soil and so on, it's uh, not so good for uh, it's not so good for agriculture and uh, it still is covered by a quite pristine rainforest from uh, plus minus uh, 300 meters about sea level, which is still considered as lowland. And really in the foothills, you can find pretty nice uh, uh, lowland forest with huge trees and so on. And uh, if you are climbing uh, up and up, uh, you will reach uh, the uh, natural timberline at about 2,200 meters uh, with uh, the typical afrotropical or afromountain uh, rainforest, uh, cloud forest, uh, where most of the clouds uh, are actually stopped and it's really humid uh, and uh, so on. Uh, what is actually uh, really interesting on Mount Cameroon uh, are precipitations. Yeah? Like Mount Cameroon uh, belong uh, among uh, the, let's say, three uh, wettest places in the world, depending on how you exactly, uh, how you exactly uh, define this. And uh, like uh, most of uh, its precipitation is actually uh, concentrated into the quite short uh, rain uh, season. Uh, when during the four months, it's almost uh, uh, every month, uh, the rainfall or precipitation, the food, food hills uh, are above uh, two meters uh, monthly, which is for me from Central Europe. Uh, this used to be something completely, un 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 in, um, I cannot imagine it uh, because it's a few times more than in my uh, home region uh, for the year. Uh, it, pre it precipitates there uh, for a month, which means really continuous hard rain uh, here are two examples, like uh, this is not a stream, like under normal circumstances, this is the tourist trail, actually the only one on the southern slopes uh, of the mountains. And this is uh, how typically uh, our camp uh, looks like uh, during the wet season. And uh, basically, uh, there is also strong uh, gradient of precipitation from the seashore where, uh, like at the foothills, uh, there are these uh, strong uh, precipitations. And this is where we perform all our research, whilst at the uh, other side of the mountains, uh, because of the rain shadow, uh, there is much less precipitation. Still quite a lot, uh, considering the Central European uh, experience, but uh, it's uh, much uh, drier. And during the uh, during the uh, dry season, uh, there is almost no rain. Uh, like uh, we have experienced uh, many times uh, something uh, like uh, resembling our autumn, our European uh, autumn, when even uh, many uh, species of uh, trees are actually uh, losing their leaves and uh, uh, everything is getting uh, quiet uh, dry. Uh, another reason why uh, we are actually studying uh, plant protein interactions on Mount Cameroon is that uh, we know uh, something about its elevation diversity uh, because uh, like we, uh, meaning uh, my group, but also uh, some other groups, especially of ornithologists are working there already for uh, like, a, I think even almost 20, uh, 20 years. Our personally started there 2014. Uh, so we have some background data. So this is uh, how or in under which, which conditions we started to uh, study the pollination networks. How we do it? Uh, we are using quite unique system of uh, like video recordings by uh, uh, by uh, cameras. Uh, these are just the normal security cameras uh, which uh, you can find or on many buildings. After like few years of testing, uh, we have some uh, we have some really useful ones, and we are recording. Uh, the interactions quite intensively. Uh, we are setting the cameras uh, for 24 hours period, uh, which is allowing us to see like uh, night visitors, uh, night pollinators, also quite a few uh, really rare visitors. 
and uh, we are setting them uh, for uh, five replicates uh, per plant species at each elevations. Actually, um, this is uh, what I should have mentioned already. Uh, we are sampling uh, uh, networks at four different elevations, starting from uh, still a lowland at uh, 650. Uh, Africa is pretty. Um, uh, like a highly elevated uh, continent, or so 650. This is uh, still uh, lowland uh, in the Congo Basin, uh, and uh, our gradient or the fourth elevation is uh, just under the timberline in uh, timberline in the cloud forest. Uh, there, uh, we actually have repeated in each of these uh, elevations uh, the sampling in dry and wet season uh, to really get the data from the two extremes. Uh, and in each elevation, we actually set uh, six transects of uh, 200 meters uh, long, uh, like uh, along uh, which we actually uh, identified and uh, uh, quantified uh, uh, all uh, flowers of all plants uh, which were there. Uh, and uh, like uh, each of them, uh, we really did our best uh, to record five specimens. Uh, we are actually recording uh, from the understory uh, through the shrubs, actually nobody responsible uh, for security in, at our university should uh, see such pictures, but we are crazy enough to do it. And we are using also uh, like uh, tree climbing techniques uh, to uh, set cameras uh, in, the, uh, in the canopies for not only trees, but also for epiphytes. And uh, this is the result after uh, like uh, many months uh, spent in the field altogether. Uh, we actually recorded uh, 220 plant species, uh, which are resulting in over uh, three uh, years of uh, video recordings, uh, which we processed uh, partly automatically, partly semi-automatically, and uh, quite a lot of them uh, we had to uh, watch uh, like uh, manually. Uh, altogether, we got quite rich uh, data set of uh, almost 50,000 uh, uh, flower visits, like interactions uh, of uh, plus minus uh, 500 morpha species of uh, visitors. And here are just uh, a few examples what our techniques are actually allowing us to see. So we can see really short uh, visits, which most probably we would not get, just like uh, this sphingit. You can see it here, it's actually slowed down and the entire visit uh, was in original uh, less than uh, half a second and still it reached the flower and it sucked the nectar. We can see something really rare, uh, just like uh, this uh, pretty uh, nice uh, visitor. Uh, I'm not aware about uh, any uh, recording of Galagos uh, like uh, uh, robbing uh, flowers. Sile will have specific talk on, on cheating and robbing uh, by visitors. You can see uh, this Kigali Africana. Here is the opening and it is really uh, leaking nectar from the hole from the uh, backside. And we can also see different uh, like uh, behavior of uh, visitors uh, of flowers. For instance, this uh, skipper, skipper butterfly in the uh, upper right corner is actually teething nectar without even touching the reproductive organs uh, of Brillantaisia uh, because uh, Brillantaisia uh, is actually, this is also slow down uh, video, but this is actually efficiently pollinated uh, by carpenter bees. And you can see how perfectly uh, the morphology and behavior of the visitor uh, fits uh, for the morphology of flower. Yeah. So uh, basically uh, this is some visualization of the of our results, of our interactions uh, here, uh, like uh, you can see, uh, uh, you can see uh, how uh, like uh, the turnover of functional groups of visitors in our networks, and you can see how uh, how dependent it is on season. Uh, uh, in the lowland forest, uh, it seems to be, from the functional point of uh, view, uh, pretty stable, and the, both networks in dry and wet season are strongly dominated uh, by bees, by either honeybees or uh, bees other species uh, of solitary bees. And the other pollinators are, let's say, relatively rare or less important and so on. Um, then actually in the dry season, uh, across the elevations, you can see that the minor groups are uh, like, uh, there is a turnover, but still uh, the most important groups are either uh, the other bees or uh, the, uh, the honeybees. It's because uh, in the highest elevations, uh, like uh, just above the timberline, there is quite a lot of uh, nests of uh, uh, wild uh, honeybees. Whilst in the wet season, like uh, except the, 
uh, except the uh, Lowland uh, network, like all networks are really strongly dominated uh, by uh, uh, flies or the other species of flies. So there is a strong uh, turnover of uh, species. This is how you visualize the connections, how you visualize the, uh, the complexity of the networks. And uh, of course, uh, like uh, you can hardly uh, see anything from that. So we are using different indices describing the characteristics of networks. And I've already warned you that the most important uh, from my point of view is the specialization within networks. And uh, here you can see that the specialization uh, is uh, strongly uh, is strongly declining uh, uh, along the elevation and the species in lowland are very highly specialized uh, during the dry season whilst they are very highly generalized during the wet season while uh, du uh, during the dry season as well while during wet season there is some unclear pattern uh, which is definitely not uh, related to MacArthur's hypothesis uh, whilst the dry season seems uh, like patterns uh, predicted uh, by MacArthur and I'm actually uh, like uh, I'm still thinking about that, as you can see, these are still unpublished results. Uh, but uh, my interpretation actually is that, uh, like, actually, according to uh, MacArthur's uh, predictions, that uh, during the dry season, uh, when uh, like uh, uh, when the environmental or weather conditions are pretty mild, pretty uh, normal, it's sunny, it's warm, uh, like you know, it's tropic. So in the system, there is still uh, enough humidity and water. Uh, species uh, are really, uh, or for, uh, for the specialization of species, the interspecific uh, competition can be more important. Yeah? So uh, when there is a lot of species, they are uh, more and more specialized, whilst when there is not so many species, then can afford or they must uh, be uh, generalized. Whilst during the bad season, uh, basically species must be very highly, uh, very highly uh, adapted uh, to the uh, very strong, uh, uh, very strong uh, uh, precipitations and especially for insects. Uh, there is not much time for being active and uh, they must use any resource which is available. So this, uh, uh, I'm not surprised uh, by actually uh, this uh, pattern. If you check the individual, in the, the individual groups, uh, some of them are showing uh, the same pattern, like during bad season, uh, the specialization is actually decreasing, while during, uh, uh, sorry, during the dry season, the specialization is decreasing, while during the wet season, the harsh uh, season, uh, the specialization stays uh, more or less stable. Uh, we have supported this uh, by some analysis, but it would be uh, too complicated maybe, uh, but some groups are actually behaving different. And I'm currently really intensively thinking why uh, this is, uh, like a group specific and so on. So I have actually checked, uh, I'm very sorry for the uh, low uh, aesthetic uh, quality of this slide. This is really uh, under process. So these are just the average uh, species specialization elevation plotted against the uh, species uh, richness. And uh, basically uh, like uh, for, the, for, for some specialized pollinating groups, it seems that uh, during the dry season, uh, there could be uh, some correlation between the specialization of individual species and between the species richness of the group uh, in the networks. Unfortunately, this is really a uh, not general pattern. Uh, like uh, many other groups are showing something really chaotic and how flies are even showing uh, the opposite groups. So uh, basically this is for uh, the, mm, this is still for some future uh, analysis to try to realize uh, how this uh, can be uh, driven or influenced by other factors. For instance, uh, by by the availability of uh, resources for individual uh, groups. And uh, now I see I'm already over the time, but uh, I will uh, I will show you uh, one more short chapter, uh, how we are thinking about our data and how uh, we are actually uh, analyzing the specialization of our networks. Uh, it's about uh, pollination syndromes. Uh, like uh, those of you who are not pollination ecologists uh, uh, may be confused by this, but uh, basically pollination syndromes are like a convergently evolved uh, combination of floral traits. 
uh, which are somehow uh, uh, like a result of uh, adaptation of uh, non-related plants uh, to be pollinated uh, by a group of pollinators. Yeah? And uh, it's not only about attracting pollinators, but also about the distracting the visitors which you don't want to attract. For instance, uh, mm, uh, plants uh, specialized for bird pollination are quite commonly red because uh, most of bees or maybe all of bees uh, cannot uh, see uh, the red color and uh, uh, these uh, uh, flowers can be uh, not so apparent uh, for uh, these uh, visitors. There are few syndromes uh, defined uh, like um, uh, beetles, flies, uh, butterflies, moths, but also for uh, also for uh, bats or mammals or, or birds. Uh, here is just uh, some like a more or less a random selection of the traits, but uh, uh, they are really composed depending on author on something between ten and twenty or even more traits uh, for each uh, uh, for each uh, syndrome. We are actually uh, testing how these, uh, because uh, there are long disputations, if these syndromes are just our anthropogenic point of view or if they really work uh, in the field. And there are like a few meta analyses, uh, like each of them is giving uh, different results. Some of them are claiming that they work, some of them are claiming that they don't work. Uh, on different uh, levels, uh, on, on different geographic scope and so on. So we are testing how it works uh, on Mount Cameroon. Actually, we have realized uh, by a random forest, uh, by random forest uh, uh, analysis that uh, for our primary pollinators, uh, so it means the most frequent pollinator uh, on each of the studied plant, only three uh, traits are actually uh, quite important. And the rest of them are not so much, uh, most probably because there is the, some strong intercorrelation uh, among uh, them. Uh, so we, are, we, we have then uh, analyzed this. Uh, we have also uh, checked uh, how the patterns of the uh, like a uh, mm, distribution of the uh, traits uh, among the networks and uh, uh, really uh, especially uh, these important ones which are actually uh, uh, flower uh, color uh, produced uh, sugar uh, per flower uh, in the nectar and the size of the flower and they are really uh, uh, like uh, differently distributed in the networks you can see that uh, if you plot uh, the uh, distribution of uh, individual traits uh, among the networks, you will realize that uh, there is a group of uh, dry season uh, plants and group of uh, wet season plants with uh, different uh, with uh, different traits. And sometimes it can make sense. Yeah, uh, the high elevation uh, plants, for instance, uh, produce more sugars uh, to nectar, most probably because of physiological reasons of their visitors, uh, who uh, which uh, needs uh, more energy in the colder environment. In wet season, for instance, there are more common uh, flowers with a uh, uh, closed uh, structure with closed morphology because then uh, the, uh, their nectar cannot be so easily washed out by the strong rains and so on. Uh, we've also realized that uh, the individual uh, primary pollinators, uh, so you know these basics for the uh, pollination syndromes, uh, they, uh, they actually uh, prefer uh, um, uh, different most important traits and also these uh, like uh, uh, these uh, most important traits for individual groups they differ among individual nectars so basically uh, they change along the elevation and they change uh, uh, in between the seasons uh, let's skip this so uh, actually our contribution to pollination syndromes theory is uh, that uh, we should not uh, we should not uh, see them or we should not consider them as the kind of null model that all the traits are uh, of equal importance for all the groups. Yeah, actually, different groups uh, like uh, uh, see the flowers differently. Uh, they are attracted by different things, and individual traits uh, are of uh, different importance for them. And uh, these uh, preferent, uh, preferred or important traits can even uh, differ uh, like depending on the environmental conditions. And for instance, if you are under harsh conditions, you need quite a lot of nectar, uh, you're more selective than if you are under mild conditions and uh, um, uh, you can actually uh, you don't you don't have uh, such a big uh, uh, such a big uh, uh, needs uh, of uh, energy, for instance. Um, just two examples that uh, the traits can be sometimes really confirmative. Yeah, for instance, uh, 
I don't know how to click it because there is some ah okay sometimes you can really predict what is coming for the uh, for the uh, flower uh, this is Kigali africana really really big uh, uh, flower uh, with a lot of nectar and uh, i would personally predict it would be visited by the uh, uh, fruit uh, bed and it is yeah but sometimes you can be really surprised this is quite a large flower uh, flowering uh, really on the uh, floor of the uh, lowland uh, or even uh, mid elevation uh, rainforest and uh, you can see that it, it is really strongly preferred uh, by uh, skipper butterflies, uh, by this uh, Celenorhinus, uh, different species. And uh, they are uh, seen really regularly there. And you can see how differently uh, they can use the flower uh, than uh, we would think uh, they would uh, do that. And this behavior has been uh, recorded in our video recordings uh, quite uh, commonly. Uh, and uh, part of this uh, syndrome story is a, a detailed analysis of a broad pollination syndrome in comparison uh, with the other syndromes uh, related uh, to uh, insect visitors. Uh, along our gradient, uh, we can find a few uh, plant species uh, which can be predicted based on the color and uh, uh, the strategy of the, uh, of the flower, just like these uh, Lorantats uh, openable only by the beaks uh, or by the uh, or by some other traits uh, can be related to birds, like in comparison uh, to many others, uh, which are basically uh, different. Uh, if you actually plot, uh, like uh, again, uh, the plants, uh, like according uh, to their uh, traits, like a variation of uh, different traits, you will realize that these uh, plants, which uh, would be predicted to be uh, like a to, to, to bear the bird pollination syndrome, you realize they are really different from most of, uh, uh, from, uh, most of uh, the uh, others. So like uh, something like a, a bird pollination syndrome uh, can exist according to, to trait, according, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, according to their, their traits. The question is, if it is then uh, seen by the birds as well. And uh, actually, Stepan Janeček uh, set a few hypotheses uh, based on the comparison how frequently they are visited by birds uh, to how frequently they are visited uh, by uh, insects. Uh, numerous uh, uh, cases uh, from uh, really being uh, distinct, uh, uh, like being distinctly visited by uh, birds and uh, insects, uh, confirming uh, uh, the, um, the the the. Uh, the syndromes or actually being uh, visited completely randomly and uh, uh, not uh, uh, like uh, showing that syndromes are uh, completely uh, useless. Uh, we have realized uh, that uh, it's something in between. Uh, basically, uh, there, there is definitely uh, uh, quite a few plants which are visited uh, by birds and not so much visited uh, by insects. Yeah, uh, But basically, uh, birds in the same time, uh, like uh, the, the black dots are those uh, uh, bird uh, pollination syndrome predicted plants, whilst the gray dots are all the other ones. Yeah? And you can see that birds are visiting quite commonly also a lot of uh, other uh, uh, flowers. So basically uh, our uh, solution or our result is uh, uh, just, uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, summarized in the title uh, of the study. So uh, it seems that bird pollination syndrome, at least on Cameroon, is really the plant adaptation to ornithophily. They are really attracting birds uh, to specific color, to specific shape, to specific uh, uh, nectar uh, properties, uh, whilst birds are actually feeding on, uh, like specifically on these, uh, like bird pollination syndrome plants, but also on many others. And uh, how they decide, like, Birds are not uh, stupid. Uh, what is very important for them is uh, like a sugar pearl flower. So, so like a nectar production of individual uh, flowers. Uh, there is uh, like a, let's say relatively tight uh, correlation uh, among the frequency of bird plant interactions and uh, quantity of resource, which is in this case, uh, which is in this case uh, like a sugars. Uh,
sorry, something has. Can you still hear me? Yes, everything okay. Okay, perfect. There was just some sound coming from the uh, from the Zoom. Okay, so my last slide. Uh, uh, sorry uh, for uh, so long uh, talk. Uh, uh, I hope it was at least a bit funny uh, or interesting. Uh, so in summary, uh, there is a strong uh, seasonal and elevational uh, turnover uh, in pollination interactions. Uh, like uh, during the dry season, uh, there is a decreasing specialization uh, along uh, elevation, which does not work for the wet season. And we have some hypothesis why it is so. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, different functional groups are showing different patterns of specialization, and we are still uh, like uh, thinking how it could be driven. Uh, pollination syndromes uh, seem uh, valid, uh, but uh, differently for different groups and under different conditions. So basically, our um, our suggestion is to uh, somehow leave the let's say mechanistic uh, or null model uh, uh, like a, a way of uh, considering of the uh, of the. Uh, syndromes and uh, rather uh, focus on how exactly uh, individual syndromes uh, can be redefined and that plant uh, bird interactions are driven asymmetrically for birds and plants. And uh, that's all from me. Uh, here is uh, like uh, acknowledgement to many people who contributed uh, to the uh, data set. Uh, of course, there cannot be all of them. There is many more uh, and I'm uh, extremely grateful to all of them. And uh, I'm also grateful to you uh, for your attention. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for a wonderful talk. I really like the conclusions. Uh, it was pretty cool and a uh, tremendous amount of work done on the watching all these years of the recordings. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we will have the discussion after the second talk. So I would like to uh, invite now Saley to share her presentation and show her results. Uh, just a second. I think I might have fixed the presentation problem, but I'm not so sure. So let's see. Uh, just a second. Can you see my screen? Is it okay? Yes, the squares are still there, but I think they will disappear. Just the one on the top, I suppose. Yeah, just one on the top. It's okay. okay. Perfect. Okay, so thanks a lot for inviting me and Rob to the TEO seminar. It's a really big thing for us, and especially for me. And thanks, Rob, for setting the screen for setting the scene for my specific study. Um, I'm Saili, and I'll be talking about an offshoot of our pollination research that goes on in Cameroon. And like Rob mentioned very briefly, I'll be speaking on cheaters in visitor, flower visitor communities of Mount Cameroon. It's something that started when I was a trainee with Rob and has continued into my PhD, so I'm pretty excited about it. Very typically, pollination mutualisms are thought of as a stereotype, but this is not true, like Rob just mentioned. Most pollination is coincidental. Flowers rely on animals for the pollination, and to attract these animals, they often provide floral rewards. In many cases, this is nectar or pollen. I will be focusing on nectar. And when animals try and extract this nectar, they end up transferring pollen. But there are visitors, like Rob mentioned, that can't or don't access floral nectar normally. Some of these animals are robbers and some others are thieves. I'll be speaking about these briefly. Now, like in legal talk, robbers are visitors that need to use force to access floral rewards. They can't normally access nectar, so they make holes in flowers so that they, so that they can access them. These can be sunbirds or the caligos that you saw in the video from Rob. Thieves, on the other hand, are visitors that have morphology that are a slight mismatch with the flowers, like the skipper that was in Rob's presentation with the purple flower. So they don't need to use force and they can pickpocket nectar, so to say. These are called morphological mismatches and they're able to extract nectar very easily. But because of their differences in traits, they must access nectar like this. Robbers are usually visitors which have sharp beaks or strong teeth, or in the case of certain insect visitors, mandibles like carpenter bees. Thieves, on the other hand, are mostly those with long tongues or small bodies that enable them to go in, inside the nectar tube and access nectar, but not end up touching any of the floral reproductive organs. 
do these cheaters actually affect the pollination mutualism in any way? It's kind of difficult to say because most of these studies are based on single species of plants. And even from those, we can have a little bit of conclusions. For example, for robbers that reduce the nectar from flowers and damage the flowers by making holes in them, they affect the flower itself, but they also induce other visitors to rob the flower from this floral opening. And this is a phenomenon called a secondary robbing. Secondary robbing reduces the flower, floral nectar, but also does not contribute to the flower being pollinated at all. Additionally, these uh, robbers can induce pollinators to access nectar through these holes. And therefore, for an individual flower, robbing is a problem because it's not going to be pollinated as much as it would if it did not rob, it wasn't robbed. On the other hand, robbing can actually be a good thing for flowers or plants because of robbing, because of robbing, flower pollinators need to move longer distances between patches. And because they need to move longer distance, be, be, distances between patches, they end up increasing the distance that they transfer pollen over. So this improves gene flow. Thieves, on the other hand, we don't have a lot of information about. This is partly because the terminology on nectar robbing and thieving is not very clear in uh, methods but also because thieves are not very interesting to most people because they just coincidentally reduce nectar and don't do much else, right? Maybe not. Thieves do reduce nectar and the flower remains intact, but by reducing the nectar of flowers, they might also be inducing pollinators to move longer distances. And they might have this, uh, this positive indirect effect on flowers. But to know if they actually affect pollination mutualisms, we need to know if cheating is frequent enough. We know something about how frequent nectar robbing and nectar thieving is in single species systems. It's quite rare, but the problem with these systems is that the, the flowers or the plants have pre-selected to be the kind of plants that robbing or thieving has been observed in. We know practically nothing about uh, how frequent cheating is on community level. And this is where our Cameroonian research is really great because we study all flowering plants in along this elevation of gradient. And we are able to extract all kinds of data from it. And therefore we have no pre-selection of which plants might be robbed. And there is no taxonomical bias there, so to say. So I decided, we decided to look at whether robbing actually changes spatial temporarily. It's not very frequent, like you can see in this bar graph. Uh, pollinating insects are still the most frequent visitors for all plants in Mount Cameroon. But you can see that there are some changes with elevation and season, like Rob mentioned before. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the dry season in Mount Cameroon. This season it has a higher prevalence of thieves than in the wet season. And the opposite is true for robbers, which are higher in the wet season than in the dry season. And in particular, for the highest elevation in the wet season, you see very little cheater. I presume this is because of the generalization and the small size of the network, but could there be something else that is driving this? We also looked at plants. So it turns out that a large number of plants are actually safe from cheaters. Why is this the case? So maybe it's not just spatiotemporal patterns. They're also being driven by something that is plant-related. So that could be floral traits. So we decided to examine this. If cheating is quite rare and only some plants are cheated, why is this the case? So these are preliminary results that helped us uh, look at large, larger patterns. This is a little complicated image, but I will walk you through it. On the left side is a network, so to say, where each solid circle represents uh, a functional group of visitors. The circle is sized by the number of plants that this functional group acts as a primary pollinator of. And arrows connect this func a functional group to another functional group that it acts as a rubber for. The strength of the arrows reflects how strong this trait overlap is. So for example, in this case, let's look at these, which, have, which are the most important primary pollinators on Mount Cameroon, but they also act as nectar rubbers very frequently. If you then look at their trait preferences, which you can see on the image on the right, which is an RDA, you can see that sunbirds and bees have slightly different trait preferences. Sunbirds end up robbing flowers which have longer nectar tubes, 
and which are bell shaped, for example, whereas bees end up robbing flowers which are labiate or uh, smaller in size but have zygomorphic symmetry. Thieves, on the other hand, are much more loser in who they decide to thieve. This should be pretty obvious because thieves don't actively uh, thieve, like I said before. They end up coincidentally being able to pick up nectar from whichever flower they visit. So the thieving ne network is more general and they end up thieving whoever they can. And which is also why you can see in the trait preferences on the right side that there is a very loose trait preference for all of these functional groups of visitors. So they seem to have trait preferences. And are these trait preferences driving the side differences? So to examine this, we decided to use an analysis called RLQ. It's a slightly complicated analysis, so I'm not going to go into the details of how we did it, but it looks like any other ordination. So if you've seen it, you should be able to follow this image. Visitor behavior varies spatial temporally. In this image, you can see that the triangles represent the sites Yellow colored triangles represent dry season sites and blue triangles represent wet season sites. When you look at the kind of behavior that visitors exhibit when they are at each of these sites, you can see that robbing prevails in certain sites. For example, here in the wet season at 650 to 1100 meters, which is like the lowlands. And thieving prevails mostly in the dry season, but also in one particular site in the wet season. The, this variation that we see in all of these sites is trait mediated. You can see that there are certain uh, floral shapes or floral symmetry uh, that each kind of behavior is more closely associated to. And this is also then related to flower color. For example, when you look, look at nectar robbing, we notice that robbed flowers have longer nectar tubes and they have mostly fused corollas. So they are tubular flowers or bell-shaped flowers, which tend to be red, pink, yellow, uh, red, pink, orange colored. And uh, these kinds of flowers are mostly present in the lowlands in the wet season. Thieving on the other hand, like we noticed earlier, is more general. And these generalist flowers are more likely to be found in the dry season. And uh, thieves end up going to flowers which have wider nectar tubes. They are larger flowers, so tiny visitors can easily enter and exit without touching any of the nectar, uh, any of the reproductive organs. So what we found was that cheaters are rare in flower visitor communities, but they might have effects on uh, the whole pollination mutualism. Their frequency varies spatial temporally. We see that in the wet season, in the lowlands, there is higher nectar rubbing, whereas in the dry season, there is higher thieving. And this variation ends up being trait mediated. Now, what I have noticed and what I would like to know further, and I haven't been working on yet, is whether there's a trade off between avoiding nectar robbers and avoiding nectar thieves. For a flower to improve its pollination success, it obviously doesn't want either of these visitors to be there, but they're not very prevalent for the flower to be adapted to them. There are some cases where this happens, but uh, when a flower wants to avoid nectar robbers, it needs to be more open and provide easy access for its pollinators. But if providing easy access to its pollinators also in increases the number of thieves that it has. So I would like to see if there's actually a trade-off for a flower between avoiding robbers and avoiding thieves. I'd like to thank everybody involved in this project, the ISAC team, my supervisor Rob, who's here, and Stepan, who's on field, uh, all of my PhD uh, colleagues, and everybody who was on field watching videos. This wouldn't be possible without them. My own PhD is uh, funded by the STARS program of the Charles University, and our research is mostly funded by the Czech Science Foundation. I'd like to thank TU for inviting us here and the Charles University for sponsoring us. If you'd like to know more about our work, you can reach out to us on our website, which is insectcommunities.cz or on Twitter at Group Insect, and you can mail me wherever you'd like. Thanks.